This is the lipids, protein and energy clip. We've already looked at how glucose can be broken down both anaerobically and aerobically to produce ATP. This next series of slides is looking at how fat and protein can also be used to provide ATP for the contracting muscle cell. Lipolysis is a term to describe in very simple terms the breakdown of fat. So that's where we get the triglycerides in adipose tissue and also in skeletal muscle metabolized or in other words broken down to their component parts which are glycerol and free fatty acids. If we just take a look at the photograph here you'll see there's a pair of skin calipers which are pinching on skin and the subcutaneous fat and connective tissue beneath the skin. So this is what we call our adipose tissue or in other words that fat tissue or the fat stores beneath the skin. In terms of the triglyceride molecule, if we take a look at the chemical structure here, it's made up of a glycerol backbone, which is shown here in the red, and three fatty acid chains, shown here in the blue. It's the fatty acid chains that provide the most energy for the cell. And that point is written down here on the bottom right hand side of the slide, where free fatty acids serve as the major energy source derived from lipids. So when we're breaking down fat for energy, we're breaking down triglycerides. These triglycerides are stored as adipose tissue or stored in adipose tissue. And when we break them down, for the most part, we're trying to access these fatty acid chains. Because as I said, it's these fatty acid chains that are important for providing ATP. These fatty acid chains are made up of hydrogen and carbon atoms. So once again, it's the accessing of those hydrogen atoms that become important for providing large amounts of ATP. And as you'll see in the slides to follow, if you've understood how glucose provides energy aerobically for the cell, then it's very, very similar for fatty acids once we get through the first metabolic pathway. So a key point from this slide is that lipolysis is the breakdown of fat. And in terms of the fat that provides energy during exercise, it's the triglyceride molecule and more specifically the fatty acids within the triglyceride molecule. You don't need to remember any of the chemical structures shown here other than a triglyceride is made up of a glycerol backbone and three fatty acid chains and it is the hydrogen that needs to be accessed in these fatty acid chains to provide ATP. And that will become clearer in the following slides. Lipogenesis is the opposite in that it's the formation of fat. And as I've already mentioned, most fat is stored in the form of triglycerides in adipocytes, so in other words, the fat cells in the body. However, some triglycerides are stored in muscle cells. And fat represents the major form of energy storage in the body. Remember that there are three fuels that can provide energy, glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids. Importantly, we store glucose as glycogen, remember in the liver and muscle. We store fat as triglycerides in adipose tissue, but strictly speaking, we don't store amino acids as a fuel source. We can access them from example, skeletal muscle, but amino acids are not stored like fat and glucose is stored in the body. This schematic here shows how excess glucose and amino acids can be converted into fat. Most of us know that if we eat too much sugar or if we consume too many high energy foodstuffs, then we can gain weight. This flow chart shows the pathway for how that happens. So for example, if you had too much glucose in the diet or too many amino acids, they can both be converted into acetyl-CoA. And hopefully you remember this term and remember that acetyl-CoA was converted from pyruvic acid in the mitochondria and acetyl-CoA is the substance that enters 
the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria. When acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria, it's further oxidized to produce NADH and FADH and remember one ATP per turn of the Krebs cycle. So that's when it's broken down. However, acetyl-CoA is also used as a subunit for building or synthesizing fatty acids. So excess glucose, excess amino acids can both be converted into acetyl-CoA and then that acetyl-CoA can be used or many acetyl-CoA molecules can be used to produce a fatty acid. So now on to the aerobic metabolism of lipids. So in other words, we're looking at how fatty acids can be used to produce ATP for the cell. This diagram here is showing you a fatty acid chain. And remember, it's the fatty acid chain that's the most important part of the triglyceride molecule in terms of providing energy. And you should recognize this structure here as the mitochondria. Now, Remember that glucose can be broken down both anaerobically and aerobically. Lipids can only be broken down or metabolized aerobically. So they must have access to the mitochondria for their metabolism to take place. The first pathway where lipids, or I should say fatty acids are metabolized is in the mitochondrial matrix. And the pathway is referred to as beta oxidation. Remember that the matrix is the very inner portion of the mitochondria. So beta oxidation takes place in the same part of the mitochondria that the Krebs cycle does and in the same place that pyruvate is converted into acetyl-CoA. Beta oxidation basically means when the fatty acid chain is broken down. When the fatty acid chain is broken down, it's formed into acetyl-CoA molecules and also FADH and NADH. Now, there is some overlap with glucose metabolism because remember that the breakdown of glucose also results in production of acetyl-CoA and also FADH and NADH. So the acetyl-CoA and the FADH and NADH, whether it's derived from glucose or fatty acids, they're exactly the same molecules. If we take a closer look at the steps in beta oxidation, for every two carbons removed, remember that a fatty acid chain is made up of carbons and hydrogen atoms. So for each two carbons removed, you get the production of one acetyl-CoA molecule. And for every two carbons removed, except for the last two, you get one FADH and one NADH produced. This diagram here is showing you, very simply, beta oxidation, which remember is the breakdown of a fatty acid chain, producing acetyl-CoA. And remember when acetyl-CoA is derived from glucose breakdown, it then enters the Krebs cycle where the acetyl-CoA is further broken down. This is exactly the same pathway for fatty acids. Once the acetyl-CoA is produced, it enters the Krebs cycle and produces NADH and FADH, just as if it was an acetyl-CoA molecule derived from glucose. The FADH and NADH that's produced also gives up its electrons to the electron transport chain. And remember that's located in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. And this is really where most of the ATP is produced via oxidative phosphorylation. This slide is showing you what I've just been talking about in a little bit more detail. So remember that beta oxidation, the breakdown of a fatty acid chain, produces acetyl-CoA and NADH and FADH. So just like with glucose, the acetyl-CoA enters the Krebs cycle. And for each turn of the Krebs cycle, you get three NADH and FADH and one ATP. The NADH and FADH give up their electrons to the electron transport chain 
and ATP is produced in the exact same manner as it is for glucose metabolism. And just to give you an idea, you have 108 ATP from a 16 carbon long fatty acid. Now on to the aerobic metabolism of protein. The building blocks of proteins are amino acids. So if you imagine this protein taken in in the diet, the protein is broken down to individual amino acids. Those amino acids can then be converted into pyruvic acid, shown here, or acetyl-CoA, shown here, or Krebs cycle intermediates. And by that we mean substrates within the Krebs cycle. So again, you should be familiar with these terms and the Krebs cycle. So amino acids can produce energy via pyruvate acetyl-CoA and the Krebs cycle intermediates. And again, the NADH and FADH that are produced give up their electrons to the electron transport chain and produce energy in the same way as aerobic metabolism of glucose and metabolism of fatty acids. Another key point to note is that amino acids, like fatty acids, can only be broken down aerobically. And that's why they require the mitochondria and also oxygen. So glucose, again, can be broken down anaerobically and aerobically, but fatty acids and amino acids can only be metabolized aerobically. It's recommended now that you attempt the quiz on LMS called Lipids, Protein and Energy. And when you're happy with your understanding of this topic, you can move on to the final clip in bioenergetics, which is sporting events and aerobic anaerobic energy contributions.